we all want to feel abundant and rich, and if our hobby can bring that to us, awesome. But a lot of get-rich-quick things, well, they turn out to have a lot of catches to them, or they're not exactly what they look like on the surface. And that includes investing, and investing in toys. Now, when I talk about investing in toys, I'm also talking about speculation. Speculation is the difference, or rather, well, let me go backwards, the difference between investment versus speculation is, well, I guess there's more guesswork. You're assuming something is going to go up in value, and you're relying on your expertise to help you choose what it is you want to make that investment in. Well, that's a very, very simplified version, but the point is, during the 1990s, there was a huge speculation jump in comic books. Investors were noting that old comic books were going for a lot of money. So they assumed that current comic books, especially ones with huge events that brought tons of people together, well, no, that's the bad example. This is a better example. Superman, there we go, 75. Huge event, lots of copies, let's buy them up and send our kids to college. Well, this is the notorious comic book speculation bust of the 1990s. There's plenty of YouTube videos going into detail about everything from special edition covers to multiple editions of the same comic being sold. There were so many comics in print that you could basically wallpaper your house in variants if you really felt like it. In fact, I'm sure somebody has done that. So while this is known as one of the uh, bigger bubble bursts of pop culture dumb, shall we say. Boy, I'm like making up terms all the time. But as far as looking at the 90s and geek culture, everyone points out the big comic book bubble burst of the 1990s. I mean, Image Comics took it to an extreme level with their variant covers being bright enough to dock a ship in a harbor. All right, so with that behind us, what I want to talk about is the other giant bubble burst of the 1990s, and that's Star Wars toys. So much like investors were looking at old comic books, especially those from the 60s and earlier, the Golden Age, they were looking at vintage Star Wars figures and noting that there were a lot that went for a very nice amount of money on the aftermarket, some several thousand dollars. And for something that started off at an SRP of $299, $499, that's a very big payback. Now, granted, most of the items selling for a lot were either extremely rare or prototypes or unproduced figures, things that there's a limited amount of. You're not going to see huge bucks going for a figure unless it has a significantly lower run, like Blue Snaggletooth, who only came with a Sears Cantina playset, along with Greedo and Hammerhead, the, and he wasn't in the main line. So, yes, it's more of the exception than the rule that a figure goes for a lot. Granted, carded figures still bring in a good amount of money. And that's because back in the 80s, we ripped open our figures. There weren't that many people keeping them on card because these were children's playthings, not collectibles. So, fast forwarding to 1995, when Star Wars was relaunched with Power of the Force 2, well, that whole seesaw of collectible versus kid was once again a major issue, where kids were buying the figures because they were great, they were bulked up, they were kid-friendly, and collectors enjoyed things like the weird variants that popped up in the first year, like the giant lightsaber Darth Vader. Granted, Darth Vader's lightsaber has always been a source of controversy with action figures, with the tip of the original one being very apt to breakage and being removed in later production. Some of the other variants from Power of the Force 2 included the notorious Boba Fett with half circles. So there was full circles, and here's half circles on his glove. Yep, if you only got half circles, you had a very hard-to-find production error that was corrected. Others included the tan-vested Luke Skywalker that was also available with long or short lightsabers. Oh my gosh, I'm giving myself a headache with this. So yeah, a slightly different color vest, or you could even find this figure on a different card given at theaters for the Star Wars Special Edition. I was actually lucky enough to be in line when these were being handed out, so I had one for a little while. But fast forward to today and look, two of the rarest variants... Brown vest, Luke, and Boba Fett half circles together for under 20 bucks? Well, why is that? Why has the price plummeted on Power of the Force 2 figures? Well, there are some actual production, industry, and fandom reasons for this. Why, when you go to comic book shops or bookshops, used books, etc., flea markets, you're finding 
Lots and lots of Power of the Force 2 figures, both loose, both in package, sold in little baggies. I hope they poke little holes so they can breathe. We wouldn't bo want Bo Sheck to pass out there. So why is Power of the Force 2 worth just a little inch over Rose Tico? Well, there are logistical reasons for this. The first off has to do with fan expectations build up from the vintage line. So when Power of the Force 2 came out, we all thought this was kind of a one-off. We didn't know how many figures we were going to get. And if we got a figure, it was a cause of celebration because this was one and done. The chance of getting another Obi-Wan Kenobi figure in the three and three-fourth scale, scale, excuse me, I mean, nobody thought that was possible. So you had that Power of the Force 2 one, and you were like, wow, all right, I got the Obi-Wan. They'll never make another one. And then they made another one. And you were like, okay, well, that one's a little different. And then they made another one. Okay, that one doesn't have his cloak, so it's a little different. And then they made another one, and then they made another one, and another. So, yes, the whole one-and-done concept that we were basically engaged with for Power of the Force 2 really made us feel we had to get those figures. And that, compared to the MOQ, which is the minimum quantity order, well... Power of the Force 2 kind of had the opposite issue. Most toy lines have a bit of a struggle with the minimum order quantity a factory requires. You don't want to produce too many because then you have clearance. You don't want to produce too few or you're leaving money on the table. And with a collector market, this is even more difficult because if you go back into production on a toy, you have to hit the MOQ again. And sometimes, while there are fans that missed out, it's not enough fans to justify the MOQ because you're dealing with a total fan base where some of them already have the figure. Case in point, this Storm Marvel Legends re-release at Target that just piled up because a significant portion of the potential fan base the audience already had her, and those that didn't want her weren't enough. MOQ for most action figures, toy lines, usually 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. In a movie year, you might be looking at, you know, getting into the hundred thousands of, say, the lead character, like a Spider-Man or a Batman, maybe even above that. You don't want a warehouse full of product, so there tends to be a guesswork, and with new properties, you're always going to want to guess a little low. Well, with Power of the Force 2, the fan base really rose up, and... Many of the figures went into the 300,000 unit run, which is ridiculously high for an action figure. Even most toys in the toy industry rarely get up to that size, unless you're dealing with outdoor toys. And at the time, for Power of the Force 2, Star Wars was pretty much considered a dead brand. It hadn't been to market in 10 years. And while there was a drought of product out there, the fan base was still there. They were just sort of in hibernation, one could say. Maybe they'd get carbonation sickness. So the last time we had Star Wars action figures was 1985 with Power of the Force 1. And while this was great, it left us with 10 years of things like bendies and pins you would pick up at Disneyland at the Star Tour shop. Not that I didn't love those pins. But I didn't own any of these bendies. I can definitely confess to that one. I thought about Akbar several times, because I love Admiral Akbar. But regardless, the point is, these were the dark times of Star Wars merchandise buying, but brand loyalty never went away. At first, it may have been underestimated, but Hasbro slash Kenner quickly went up to speed and went into full production of Power of the Force 2, satiating was a huge demand. So... If you're collecting figures because you're hoping to speculate and resell them later, hey, more power to you. Every right to do that, and there are Star Wars figures that sell for a lot of money. Granted, they're usually the vintage original era. But Power of the Force 2 is now getting commemorative figures. Even a figure like this, a 6-inch Ceremonial Leia, which technically was never released as a 3 and 3 fourth on that type of card, but that's not important right now. The point is... Power of the Force 2 has now been elevated to, uh, you know, <laughs> they're now making toys based on it. So, whatever you collect, whatever it is that's rare, however you like to display your toys, that's what collecting is all about. If there's figures that go up in value, it tends to be more icing on the cake, and that's really cool, versus holding on to something for a long, long time, hoping that it might, you know, give you that mansion at the end of Game of Life. I hope you enjoyed this video and it clarified a little bit why Power of the Force 2 went into such huge numbers that the value just never got there on the secondary market. If you have any questions or comments, leave them below. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.